So the big picture, I think, is in terms of where we are, is that we've talked about uh, multi-phase flow to get in place, controlled by relative permeabilities in terms of rates, and controlled by interfacial properties in terms of uh, the resting location where it hangs. Uh, that will dissolve and will be entrained potentially as dissolved components in groundwater. And those can then be transported. They can be transported either as a conservative species, where everything that's in the dissolved phase stays dissolved, never gets taken out onto the solid. And components like that would be typical ions such as chlorine and sodium as they travel downstream, salts. Um, and they would never be less lost to the flow field. Uh, but other materials, such as the ones that we're concentrating on, typically these hydrocarbon products, these synthetic components, DNAPLES maybe, um, are actually only very slightly soluble in water, uh, but are sorptive, uh, especially with compounds such as um, organic carbon in the same way that you'd put water with these compounds in them through an activated carbon filter in your house or in an industrial plant to remove the solvents, if that activated carbon or carbon is present in the, the aquifer, it will also act in the same way to take it out of solution and attach it to the substrate which isn't moving. And so that's kind of where we uh, start from. Uh, so that's kind of the, the broadest recap. The, the finer grained recap, I guess, is to talk a little bit about what we said about retardation. Um, and that is just to make this case, once again, that if we look at non-conservative behavior, then what we can do is we can look at the response uh, based on these things that we've drawn already. And I won't, oh, yes, I will. I will bore you with the expression. You know that we're solving the advection dispersion equation. We don't care about what the individual solving it ourselves, but we do care about what the individual terms might mean. And so I don't need to define the terms because you've seen this. And importantly, when we talk about retardation, we have this extra term on the front end, which is a density of the aquifer. Um, the volumetric moisture content, which is in the limit for saturated material, is the porosity, and this distribution coefficient, K sub D, that we've defined. And so this is this retardation factor that we've uh, referred to. And so what we could do is we could divide both sides through by retardation factor, in which case we get this, which is an equation which is exactly the same as one times the accumulation term and the other, and these slightly modified terms on the left-hand side. And if we do that, importantly, the behaviors we get if we draw this boundary condition for concentration is time and relative Just from this expression, what do we know? We know that velocity is equal to length over time. So length is equal to the product of velocity times time. And time is equal to uh, length 
divided by velocity. And we can multiply this by 1 over retardation. And we can multiply this by retardation. And that allows us to define this behavior that the length traveled to the center of mass. So this is the 50% portion is equal to velocity times time divided by retardation factor and I guess this response here would be some time which is given by this amount here time taken to arrive is equal to retardation times length divided by velocity advective velocity in all cases and so the ones that we drew here are for r equals one let's say i guess i can make it bigger and if we do it for the case uh, the converse case where it's re uh, not uh, where it's not conservative then it would look something like this and this would also conform to this value of length traveled is equal to well, no I won't do that take that as a given but this is for retardation greater than one uh, is one plus a value. If this value is finite, then it's greater than one. And if that's the case of here, then this behavior would be somewhere over here. Right? So this is r greater than one in green. This is a one, in case you can't see it. And so that's the essence of what we're attempting to do. So everything revolves around this idea that we can define the magnitude of this retardation factor it means that the velocity at which some average front moves is retarded, it's delayed, uh, and it's delayed in the amount proportional to this value. If it's 1, then it's not delayed. If it's 2, then it gets there, it's, it moves half as fast. If it's 4, it's a quarter times as fast, which means its arrival is delayed by twice as long. So it's all, all very logical. And if we want to do this, we have to be careful in doing this because we realize that when we talk about this, the careful part is that we know that these response curves aren't quite the way we've drawn them here. And we know that for real systems, if we define them for instance, uh, in terms of uh, the two properties um, for the real case, where we define a Peclé number, which is a um, velocity times the length of flow divided by a dispersion coefficient and a pore volume, T sub R, which we can define as uh, something like this by just rearranging this as um, time multiplied by advective velocity. So I'm just going to rearrange this so everything's on the left-hand side divided by retardation and a length then this term here is what we refer to as a pore volume. And physically it means that when you put something in at one end and it's the front has traveled to the end of the core, it's completely displaced one pore volume of the fluid in moving from upstream to downstream physically means that. So if we plot these values as pore volumes versus relative concentrations, exactly like the figure up above, uh, but now we do it 
not in terms of real time, but in terms of this pore volume time. You recall that we had this value which was one pore volume, two pore volumes. I'll do it very light up to the top, so it's very thin, so you'll see this. Then uh, the behaviors that we expect to get are that when this Peclé number is equal to 100, so this number is 100, then it's basically this sharp front breaking through. So it looked like a, a sharp front here, and therefore it would rise as a sharp front. If it's equal to 10, then it was something like this. And if it's equal to 1, then it might be something like And so the, the point is that this center of mass is not always exactly located on this part. And so the, the pore volumes that you can use can actually include this value of retardation. When we did it uh, before, um, we just used a pore volume TR that was equal to the time taken, the advective velocity, and the length of the core, the distance downstream. So this, if you like, is this is this length. But if we want to accommodate retardation, we have to accommodate this extra term. Um, these terms are all dimensionless. They have no dimensions. So velocity times length is length squared over time. And this dispersion coefficient is length squared over time. So the, they cancel out. And this is going to be velocity times time, which is just a length divided by a length, which has no dimensions in this. And of course, if you look at this, if you're adding anything to one, by definition, it has to be, this term has to be dimensionless still. And so this is the way that we can accommodate retardation in the, these um, analytical solutions that we used. And so, so that kind of hopefully defines things as, as we had before. And so it's clear from this that the rate the time at which this arrives in terms of real time, if it's retarded, it's delayed. Um, it looks slightly different in this non-dimensional time because we're dividing through by this factor, so it kind of pushes it in the other direction and it, it kind of normalizes it in some way. But physically, in real time, it's always delayed. And the two features that you'd see if you looked at a snapshot in the aquifer is one, that it's traveled less far because of this sorption, but also that the, the, the front is sharpened. And it's sharpened because basically we're decreasing the dispersion that's present in the system. So it all makes, hopefully it makes uh, perfect sense. So that's kind of where we, we're starting from. So now what we'd like to do today is that last time you'll remember that what we did was we tried to figure out exactly what this value of the distribution coefficient was. And one way to do that is to figure out exactly what R is. And if you know what R is, then the only other parameter in these that we can't get very easily is this one, which we can solve for. And we can get retardation very easily as just equal to the advective velocity of the non-conservative solute divided by the advective velocity of the conservative one. That's what we did. And so the manifestation of that, when you look at these data, is that for these plumes, which are either chloride, which is not retarded, versus carbon tetrachloride or PCE, which both are, then if you just take the velocities of those, which are proportional to the distances they travel in a given time, then you get the value of R for that. If you have the value of R, then you can solve for KD. And we did that last time. That's basically what we did. So that's fine if you have a plume to be able to do that. What happens if you don't? And so the question is, how do you get the magnitude of this distribution coefficient, which we like to have, if we don't have some previous value, if we have a green field, for instance? And so what we can do is we can try and relate it, at least for these uh, solvent materials, to two parameters. Uh, one is the octanol water partition coefficient, uh, which is how much uh, the, the partitioning between octanol and water, 
what proportions get dissolved in each uh, in a solution, or with the solubility of that particular uh, solute in water as a solvent. And so we can use those as indices to be able to, both of them, to be able to predict values of this distribution coefficient. And if we have the distribution coefficient, then we can use it to calculate um, the value of uh, the retardation, right? basically. If we know this, and we know this, then we have R, and it's R that defines exactly how our plume behaves in the subsurface. So we'll do that first uh, and talk about basically the recipes by which we can do that. Uh, we'll talk about what happens if we have multiple compounds together so that they're all competing to get dissolved in water. And you've probably come across Reynolds Law elsewhere to, to do that. Uh, we can look at how quickly mass is removed from aquifers based on these solubilities that we can predict. And place if we see that there's a plume present and we can measure the concentrations in the liquid how do we calculate what the mass is in place and it's more complicated than just taking the water concentration and multiplying by the volume of water because a portion of it is sorbed onto the the solid substrate which isn't moving so the bottom line is we want to be able to figure out exactly what these uh, de retardation magnitudes are in, in greenfield sites and so it turns out that if you look at uh, aquifers, the biggest sink for these components is going to be within organic carbon, which exists within the sites, in the aquifers rather. And so although these solutes are actually very low solubility, they actually are hydrophobic. They want to get out of the water, and they want to get into other things. The other things uh, typically are organic matter that might be present in an aquifer. And if organic matter is present, then it typically acts as the chief source, a sink for it rather, but not the only one. And so what we can do is we can come up with this relationship that allows us to calculate the value of this distribution coefficient as equal, just by rearranging this expression, as equal to the organic carbon partition coefficient, the proportion of the solute, the Dean apple that sorbs into the solid, multiplied by its weight fraction, the fraction of organic content. So in other words, if we know how much goes into the organic carbon and the fraction of that organic carbon that comprises the aquifer, we can calculate how much, how strong the sorption is. That's basically what we're trying to do. But if we're doing this, this organic carbon partition coefficient only accounts for the carbon that goes in, sorry, the solute that goes into the carbon and not stuff that would be sorbed in other parts of the aquifer, for instance on the grains. If it could sorb onto the surfaces of the quartz, then it would be incorrect for us to just calculate the sorption capacity based on how much can only go into the carbon. And so it turns out that if this fraction of organic content is less than a thousandth by weight in the aquifer, then this is just fine to use this. Because if there's more than a thousandth of the proportion of the aquifer, a tenth of a percent, then that's a significant amount of carbon, and the amount that gets sorbed onto the grains of the quartz is very small, and so we could ignore it. But the converse of that, if it's less than that, then we can't ignore the amount that would go onto the the quartz. And so the first two things that we'll do that we talked about in terms of doing these both assume that all of the carbon, all of the sorption occurs within carbon. And if that's not the case, then we can't necessarily use that. Okay. So this threshold value is either 0.1% or 1%. We'll use 0.1% in this class you know, just because there's some variability with it. And so the first solutions that we'll talk about are figuring out exactly what that is. And it's kind of um, epitomized in this. So if we're assuming that the main sorb sorbing component within the aquifer is organic carbon, then we can figure out what the magnitude of this is. And if we know how much th the fraction is, bigger than 0.1%, then we multiply the two together and we get this. This is very easy to get. You take the aquifer, it's got some 
organic carbon in it or carbon in it. You incinerate it, you weigh it before and afterwards, and the amount that gets uh, volatilized off and burnt off is the actual amount of carbon. So it's very easy to determine this organic uh, content. And so in this recipe, so long as we meet this proviso, we can calculate this distribution coefficient in two ways. We can figure it out either based on the octanol water partition coefficient, or we can do it in terms of the solubility. And both are just parameters that are reported in um, uh, reference texts to be able to, you know, engineers' uh, source books. And so what we'll do is we'll go through a couple of examples for each one of these, basically using Fedder's tables, and figure out how to come up with KOC. If we have KOC, so if we can calculate this, we can calculate this, know what this is, we get this, and if we have this, we know that we can calculate the retardation coefficient. So that's our sequence. This just goes into this. So that's what we're attempting to do. So now, if we have that, we, we're able to calculate how quickly our plume may or may may not use. So this is the solution. We can use a recipe either with solubility or with uh, octanol water partition coefficient. The first one here is with solubility. It's pretty straightforward. Horrible slide. Hope you can maybe see it. I don't know if you can or not. Let me get rid of this to make it maximum size. So here is the, the idea. So for different solutes, there are a whole bunch of different expressions you could imagine that describe this uh, organic carbon partition uh, coefficient. And they're a function of solubilities. So we could take one here that references uh, the behavior of ethyl benzene. And so if we take this, if we know the value of the solubility of ethyl benzene in uh, water, uh, then we can use that. So it turns out the solubility of ethyl benzene is 140 milligrams per liter. Importantly, these expressions have to be in the correct units. Milligrams a, a liter uh, are the required units. And so 140 milligrams, because you're taking logs of them, and they're not um, homogeneous uh, equations, the log of 140 is something a little bit bigger than 2, right? Log 100 is 2, log 1000 is 3, so the log is 2.15. If you substitute that into here, then you get this expression here. And the, the log of the organic carbon partition coefficient ends up being whatever this expression is, which is 2.46. And if you uh, 10 to the x that, you get the magnitude of the value, which is 10 to the power 3.64, which is um, no, 10, to the, 10 to the power 2.46. So 10 to the power 2.46 is somewhere between 100, which would be 10 to the 2, and 1,000, which is 10 to the 3. And it's equal to this, roughly 300. So the organic carbon partition coefficient is this. Again, if this is in milligrams per liter, this is in milliliters per gram. And if we have this magnitude, then we could go back here with this value that we have here. And now we have, sorry, we have this. If we multiply it by the amount of the fraction that we have in our aquifer, we have this, and then we have this. That, that's all it is. It's just a recipe. So if we know the solubility in the right units, for any compound, we can take the log of that. If we put the log of it in this expression, we end up with the value of this term on the left-hand side. If we 10 to the x this, we end up with this. Sorry, this here. And if we use this in the right units, then we have the value that goes in here. And then by definition, if we know the fraction, we have this. So it's no more involved in this. So we can do it either in terms of this one parameter we have, which is the solubility, or we can also do it in terms of uh, the octanol water partition coefficient. 
So again, a whole series of different expressions depending on which the individual uh, materials might be. We've just taken one for miscellaneous organics, which is that the uh, organic carbon partition coefficient is equal to some fraction of the octanol water partition coefficient. So as long as we can figure out what this is, then we should be okay. Um, and so, I'm just using this, make it a bit smaller so you can see what's going on. If we take, if we, again, you look up the value of the log octanol water partition coefficient is 2.13. So if this is the log of this, 10 to the x's would be 10 to the power 2.13, which is 100 and change. Uh, if we substitute this 100 and change into this value of this expression here, which is 0.63 times the coefficient, then we get KOC. And this is the same value as we had before. And this is the value that we could use uh, directly to go into um, the previous expression, which is just that KD is equal to KOC, organic carbon partition coefficient, multiplied by the fraction of organic carbon. So once we have this, this is also in the same units as before that we had it. It's in milli, uh, milliliters per gram. And so long as we're consistent in those units, we're just fine. So it's not particularly rewarding, it's just a recipe that gets used. And so there are a variety of these expressions to define it either in terms of solubility, one of those expressions is here, or in terms of octanol water partition coefficient, the partitioning, how much octanol gets dissolved in water basically is what this expression is. And if you can do that, you can figure out exactly what KOC is. And if you know how much carbon you have, you can figure out what the distribution coefficient is. These have to be in the same units. Uh, as uh, milliliters per gram and if you substitute it in here it should work out fine That's right so if this is in milliliters per gram the density is in kilograms per meters cubed these are units of volume these are units of mass and therefore, by definition, this term has, has no units. Okay? So that's it. So a bit involved, maybe, uh, but it's really just a, a recipe. So what we could do is we could go back to Borden, and we did, uh, we have this calculation uh, from before. We could do the calculation uh, for Borden was the case where we had these two plumes that were traveling down gradient. And they had uh, carbon tetrachloride as one of the components. And it had uh, chloride, which is one of the components. So this is partially sorbed because it's not traveled as far in two years. And so what we did last time was from these distances that they've traveled, we know that the retardation factor is going to be equal to the difference between 57 meters and 23.5 meters, which is about 2, is about 2.3 or something. I guess the numbers are somewhere. 2.42. And we use that number to resubstitute into this. So if we know this, we can get this value. And so we can rearrange it like this. And so we take the retardation minus 1. 2.42 minus 1 is 1.42. Throw in some numbers for the values of porosity, 30%, and bulk density is uh, 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter, which is 2 kilograms per liter. And we end up with values of this distribution coefficient in terms of milliliters per gram of something like 0.213 milliliters per gram. So that, that's the number. So a fraction of a decimal, 0.2. So that's calculated, and that should be the real value because it's representing real data. What happens if we use our calculation here to be able to figure out exactly what that is? So for Borden, the fraction of organic carbon is uh, 
hundredths of a percent, two hundredths of a percent. So this is 0 0.0002 as a mass fraction. Uh, carbon tetrachloride, the solubility is 805 milligrams per liter. And so if we use that in this expression that we had before, this is 805 milligrams per liter. Uh, the log of that is going to be close to 3. 10 to the 3 is 1,000. It's actually 2.9. If we go through the rest of this expression, we get the log octanol carbon partition co coefficient is 2. It's the log, so if we 10 to the x, um, 2.04, this term here, we end up with 110, right? 10 to the power of 2 is 100, so it ends up being 110 milligrams per liter. And if we go back to this expression here, where we take the product of the amount of carbon and this new value we've just calculated, 110 times 0.02 percent, which is this number here, we end up with a value of 0 0.02 mill milliliters per gram. The one we just calculated is the one that's underneath here, which is 10 times larger. And so what is that telling us about the system? It's telling us that the real sorption is 10 times larger than what we would estimate if we use this procedure. And the question is whether that means that this procedure works or not. And of course, you realize that if we're requiring that we're applying this where we have 0.02% carbon and we should have um, <coughs> greater than 0.1% carbon. So we don't satisfy that requirement. So we shouldn't be using this expression, right? And so if we do use this expression, what it assumes is that there is a very small amount of carbon in the system and that that small amount of carbon is the sole mechanism by which we get sorption. And so, if there's a very, in the, as this disappears, there'll be no sorption at all, right? If this was zero, there'd be zero sorption, zero retardation. And so, it's not surprising then that the estimate that we get from assuming that the, all of the sorption occurs in the carbon completely underestimates the amount that's present. And I guess it underestimates the amount, so we're under the amount by a factor of 10. And maybe, uh, I think it's just a coincidence that these are off by a factor of 10. But it's exactly the, the result that we'd expect, is that our prediction of what the sorption should be drastically underestimates what it should be, because we're not accounting for all the sorption that occurs on the grain surfaces, which we've completely ignored. And so that's the rationale of, of whether we should or shouldn't use that expression. Hopefully that makes makes sense. All right. What are the other ramifications of this, I guess? Well, I guess the other ramifications are of these observations of plumes is there are two things that are apparent. So you remember that when we talked about moving uh, material downstream, we talked about two effects. So if we looked at the, uh, the plume where it was not retarded in any way, it would look something like this. And if it was delayed, then it would look like this. So two effects. One is that it travels not so far. But the other one is that it's much sharper. And I suppose if we looked at this in terms of a plume going down that instead of a a source that turns on at time zero and stays turned on, this is the response that we get uh, as we go downstream. If it was a, an ephemeral source that would change as it went downstream, then I suppose we'd expect two different things. One would be that it would, uh, if it was not retarded, then it would look like this. So that this, again, there's two features of this curve. And I'll do the other one in blue. It would be this. So the, the, the right hand one is where r is equal to 1. And the left hand one is where r is greater than 1. It's about a factor of 2 here, right? So there's two features. 
in the same way that for these straight lines, one, it didn't go as far, but also it was sharper. The, the consequence of that for this plume that is just a, uh, a blob of ink that gets put in at time zero and gets carried downstream is that one, this unretarded one goes further, as you'd expect, but also its geometry is different. It's spread much further because dispersion, if we look at this expression, dispersion in the unretarded one, where r is equal to 1, is a big number. And when r is equal to 2, the top, the numerator hasn't changed, but this has got larger, and so the effective dispersion is smaller. And so sh we should expect that the, um, the bell curve isn't quite as wide. And it's, this is the same as the sharpening of the plume. And you see that here. This is a big plume that's a big wide cloud, and this is a slightly less wide cloud, and this is an even less less wide cloud. And so those are the two things that we would expect. And so we should expect these things to happen for plumes that develop in the field. And one of the examples that you're doing, uh, you know, if, if, if you think about this as being a source that keeps on providing material into the flow field, then I suppose if it was a chloride plume, you'd expect the, the plume to actually look like, like this, right? It'd be encompassed in this whole thing. So in other words, we've talked about these two end member cases. One is a core where you have one dimensional flow and it looks like this profile along the length of the core. Or we have a cloud that travels from the upstream, but the cloud boundary conditions is it's turned on and then it's turned off straight away and it just drifts along disconnected from its origins. But if at the origins it keeps on supplying mass into the flow field, then the boundary around this green line would be actually what the plume would look like if it was a continuous source. But still, if we wanted to, if we looked at the front, we could use this length of the front relative to a retarded species to be able to come up with the retardation value. And so what we could do from a variety of um, examples in situ, we could come up with magnitudes of what we expect these retardation values to be based on field observations of looking at plumes. And so this t table that was the one that I was just about to go to here but didn't get to is exactly that. And again it's smudged but hopefully you can make this out. So a variety of uh, sites around the world, many of which Uh, the Borden site is the one that we just looked at in terms of a natural gradient experiment uh, and a, a, a variety of other ones. That the magnitudes of these retardation factors that you can calculate are 6s, 12s, 30s. And so we've talked about magnitudes which are of the order of 2 or 3 in the Borden site. So these are the data here that we've kind of already looked at depending on the different substances. But in other, depending on other materials, they can, in this particular case for chlorobenzene, they can be a factor of 30. And so they, this just gives some idea of the, the magnitude of the range of these ones. And carbon tetrachloride, of course, it depends not only on the substance, but on the aquifer. If there's lots of sorbing material in the aquifer, it'll be more heavily delayed than otherwise. But these magnitudes are, can be significant. Okay. All right. So I guess um, keyed in by this idea that a single plume might have more than a single component present, and the example that you're going to do from the Smithville site in Ontario uh, is exactly that case with PC, TCE and PCBs in it. Then the other thing that we might also talk about is what the role is of having multiple solutes. And so what happens if you have more than one component uh, that wants to dissolve in water? And you will probably have used Raoult's law before. Uh, but it's basically making the case that if you have water as the solvent and different components wanting to dissolve themselves in there, the number of sites where it can do that is limited by the available sites just like sorption sites on an aquifer. And so Raoult's law basically says that the effective solubility, 
is equal to the pure phase solubility. So pure phase solubility is if you take water and one substance and dissolve one in the other. The solubility at equilibrium is what you measure for that case. No other sol solutes completely. And if you do it then for a second one, again in fresh water, that's the pure phase solubility. But when you have multiple components which are present in different uh, proportions in free phase, then they'll all complete with each other. And their effective solubilities are given by the mole fractions. Not by the weight fractions, but by the mole fractions that are present. And so you could imagine that um, you could do the calculation that if you have 10% by mass of this, 90% by mass of this, then the solubilities will be in the fraction 10%, 90%. That's almost true, but it's not because it's done in the, the mole fractions. So the calculation to do that, say for um, Smithville, is just this uh, calculation at the, the bottom of the page. So it's easy to do it as an example rather than anything else. And so this is the example here. So the, these are the data for um, the Smithville site. You have three compound, uh, four compounds actually, TCE, trichlorobenzene, and PCBs and mineral oils. The weight percent proportions are 2%, 10%, 50%, and 38%. So together, obviously, they sum to 100% by definition. If you know the formula weights for these, uh, in terms of uh, one mole of these, grams per mole, then these are 131.4, etc. for each of these, and some, some magnitudes. So if you know that by weight percent or mass percent, you have 2%, you can get the moles that are present in a 100 gram cocktail as just by taking this uh, 2%. So imagine 100 grams of this, you take 2% of it, which is 2 grams, divided by the formula weight, and that gives you the, the mole fraction that's present, or the moles per 100 grams. Do the same, which would be, um, this would be 10 divided by 181, etc., to get this. You sum up the number of moles. This is just the sum of all those components. And so if these are the components of number of moles of each of the phases, then the combined number of moles present is 0.677. And so now if, if that's the number of moles that are present, if you divide this moles that are present divided by the total number of moles, that gives you the molar fraction. And so the molar fraction here is 2.2% instead of 2% by weight. And that's just by virtue of the fact that the different molar weights of these are different. If they're all the same molar weights, then the, the weight fractions and the mole fractions would be identical. And it, I guess it uh, gives you a lower weight mole fraction than the mass fraction if the weights are progressively higher, etc. And if you then take these mole fractions and multiply by the solubility, TCE solubility is 1060 milligrams per liter. 2% of that is 23. And so these would be the e equilibrium concentrations that would be present around a source. So you have the stuff sitting in the ground as a free face. It dissolved into the water. The concentrations in the water around that free phase material would have a maximum magnitude of 23 milligrams per liter of uh, TCE, 1.5 something of TCB, etc. So it allows you to calculate the amounts. And of course, these amounts are much less than the free phase solubilities. So instead of 1,000 parts per million, it's something like 23 parts per million. And so uh, these would be the magnitudes that you'd use to calculate uh, the components going downstream. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So when you use these, for instance, you should not use these magnitudes if you use this to calculate these free phase solubilities, right? We made the case that you could do this expression to calculate what the organic carbon partition coefficients, these should be the free phase solubilities. 
not the effective solubilities. You can change it later, but to get this value, you should use the free phase one. So 10, 1060 or no, 1160 in the case of uh, TCE instead of 23 that we just talked about. Okay, so be careful at least with that. So that's Raoult's law, and so there's a, di a slightly different write-up on there, but it's basically the same thing. And I'm guessing that you've seen this in your, your prior life. Let's come back to this if we have time. Um, what else? So in terms of the things that we might want to, to be able to define, we'd like to be able to say something about defining sorption, and we've done that through two different ways. We've talked about figuring out what the effective such solubilities are. And so the other thing is if we have this stuff present in situ and we know the uh, maximum solubilities and we know how quickly water is infecting through it, we have some way of being able to calculate what the mass removal rate might be. And that's a relatively straightforward calculation. If we think that we can define um, a mass removal rate as being equal to mass divided by time or mass, remo mass removed per unit time then what we could do is we could rearrange that to get the time taken to remove that full amount of mass is just going to be equal to the total mass that's present divided by the mass removal rate in fact, you've already done this calculation in one of your assignments, maybe assignment three or four. Assignment four, actually. Right? You know how much mass is present within the aquifer. You know how quickly you remove it by being dissolved. And your calculation was that the mass removal rate was the area times the advect by the Darcy velocity multiplied through by the concentration. If this concentration is actually the maximum magnitude as a solubility, that's actually what you used, then so long as you know how quickly water is moving through it, and you know the area, cross-sectional area, you can calculate the mass removal rate. If it's being removed at one kilogram per day, and you have 10 kilograms, then it takes 10 days to be removed. So it's, it's a statement of nothing else other than that. So we can look at perhaps more sophisticated methods of being able to do that calculation. And they fall into two categories. One would be kind of the one that you've already done, where it's distributed in space. So if you imagine an aquifer where this cube in the subsurface is filled with this um, free phase component at some residual saturation, say, and you have water going through it, and that water reaches some equilibrium saturation, so in other words, it's solubility, then you could calculate how quickly that's removed, and if you know the removal rate, you can calculate how long it takes to be removed. The other one is if you look at these lenses that we have, you could look at the water that's flowing both over the top of it and underneath it and a portion of this component is diffusing away from this lens into the water and you'd like to know the mass rate at which it gets carried downstream by the water which is taking this uh, diffusing amount away from it. So those are the two end member conditions that we can look at. The first one you've already done. The time taken to, re to deplete it is the mass that's available divided by the rate of removal. The mass would be equal to what? I guess you could, do I calculate it here? What would, what would the mass be? The mass would be equal to the volume of this cube multiplied by its porosity multiplied by its saturation I think, right? Multiplied by the density of the napple. I think that's right. So density is kilograms per cubic meter. Volume is in cubic kilograms, uh, is in uh, cubic meters. So this is in kilograms. This is a proportion, which is the proportion of the pore space 
which is saturated with this. So this, these together would be the volume of the napple multiplied by its density. Uh, so kilograms per volume multiplied by volume is a mass. So we can get the mass that's present. And if we know the mass rate of removal, then the mass rate of removal is equal to what? We already said it. It's equal to the cross-sectional area of flow, which is this area here. The Darcy velocity multiplied through by its concentration in the water. So CW is the, the dissolved <laughs> concentration of the napple. Uh, this Darcy velocity is equal to, we know that Darcy velocity is equal, to, so usually write it the other way, right? We know that advective velocity is equal to the Darcy velocity divided by porosity. So if we multiply both sides, then the Darcy velocity is equal to the product of advective velocity and porosity. So this is just advective velocity and porosity. And I'm only writing it that way because that's exactly the way it's written here. And so this is the rate of removal. This is the mass that's available. And if you throw some numbers into this for typical numbers, it ends up giving you the time taken to remove material as being a big number. Not hours, not days, not weeks, not months, but typically decades or more. And that's because the um, solubilities of these are really small. And so you can look at just the, the magnitudes of these solubilities, which are the maximum magnitudes that you can remove it at. And even if you have water going through here quite quickly, then the rates at which you remove it are quite slow. And so it's not surprising that these things still persist after uh, years and decades since they're put in the ground, maybe in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. And so it's not surprising that's the case. So that's one way of looking at it in this kind of distributed way. The other way to look at it is what happens to these lenses that you'd have water flowing over. And it's the same approach, but just slightly different calculation. So this now represents the pool in side view, sliced through. It has a height and it has a length. So you can imagine the pool looking like a, a quarter, like a disc on its side, hockey puck maybe although quite a thin hockey puck, has a diameter, has a height. And again, if we look at the time taken to remove it, it's going to be given by the mass divided by the mass removal rate. And I guess we could write this in terms of the mass per unit area. and the removal rate per unit area. So this is basically saying that if we take this hockey puck and we draw it kind of in perspective, then just like the Yucca Mountain example, we're going to take an area of this, which is say one by one in area, one by one, and we're going to look at the, the amount of stuff that escapes top and bottom from that, you know, these fumes that you see coming off here. And so this is the, the mass removal rate averaged per unit area. So that's all that means. And so we get an expression for that, and it's four times this coefficient of dispersion, which we know, right? This would be diffusion coefficient, so this is 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second, roughly. This is whatever the advective velocity is. And we said that this transverse um, dispersivity is typically equal to um, the length of the plume divided by 10, if you remember. It's this surprising thing that actually isn't a number that relates to the physical properties of the porous medium, but relates to the size of the plume. So, we, so that's in units of length. This is in units of length over time. 
So this is length squared over time, just like this is. Uh, if the velocity is zero, then this is the dominant process by diffusion. If the velocity is large, then this term is inconsequential, and it's all by mechanical mixing. We know those things. Uh, this is advective velocity, which is the velocity of the water that's flowing over the top of this. This is the diameter of the, the hockey puck, or the yeah, diameter, LP. And this, is, uh, this would be the, 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 the solubility. This is a concentration that's dissolved in water just at the interface here. And so this would be solubility, which we just calculated. And this would be the prosody, effective prosody of the porous medium. And so those are all parameters that we can get. And so if we can calculate the mass removal rate for this, from this expression, this is just a diffusion equation. It's actually the, the solution for heat flow, uh, but that's not very important. Then um, the time taken for it to remove it is going to be this mass removal rate per unit time per unit area, which we have, uh, 1 over that multiplied by the mass. And so that's exactly what this expression is here. So the time taken to remove it is going to be uh, the mass. And the mass would be equal to what? It would be equal to this height here, I guess, is HP but is also equal to pH. I guess I've got dyslexia. pH is really the height of the lens. And so this is the height of the lens. This is the porosity and saturation is the amount of NAPL that's present in the pore volume. This is the density. And so, yeah, so the, so the mass is just going to be equal to the volume times the porosity times the saturation multiplied by the density of the napple. And in this case, the volume is just going to be 1 times 1 times the height. 1, 1. hope I'm not belaboring this. It's not. Uh, this is pH. So this volume is just pH times 1 times 1 because it's unit area. And so that's exactly this expression here. So the mass is this top term, exactly the same as this, hopefully. And uh, the denominator is equal to the mass rate of removal. And so if you use those, you can calculate how long it takes to be depleted. And it's a function of mass removal rate from the top expression and how much mass you have in the system. So again, simple mass balances. And if you went through the calculations again, you'd end up with the same year, months to years to decades uh, kind of outcome from this. It turns out um, that these magnitudes of solubility are actually not so easy to define. We, we've figured out exactly how we can do it uh, based on octanol water partition cove. Uh, yeah, we can we can work out. We know we can get solubility magnitudes directly from charts, and so we can figure out what they are. And so, if we do that for TCE, you could imagine an experiment where you take an aquarium and you put uh, fill it with sand and you put a pool of TCE in the bottom, and then you flow water in from one side and out the other side of the aquarium. And that's exactly what was done by uh, uh, Schwiele, maybe in the 1970s, uh, no, mid-1980s, late 1980s. And if you do that, and you measure the concentration that comes out of the other side, you find out that the concentration at the exit, instead of being close to the solubility, of 1,000 milligrams per liter is something like a tenth of that. 
and that the magnitude of the concentration reduces as you increase the, the velocity of flow by an order of magnitude, right? From one to almost 10 times. It doesn't go down by a factor of 10, but it reduces. And so the mechanism of that, you can imagine, is that the material that here is trying to, is diffusing at some particular rate, in this case only upwards, but if there was flow below it, it would also be diffusing downwards. It's the glass bottom of the tank below it. And that gets entrained, if you like, in the water that's going across the top. So you can imagine if the water sits there stagnantly, it will reach the same concentration as the equilibrium concentration as it comes off here, which would be close to this. But if it's moving at some velocity, it only has a finite time to be able to do that. And so the rate limiting process here, I guess, is diffusion from this physically away to the fluid that's flowing past here and then being carried in this downstream. So you can imagine if you took this to maybe um, 0 0.01 meters per day, maybe this concentration would be 900 milligrams per liter. Don't know, some number, but you think that as you went to zero velocity, the magnitude, if you only have one component, should ultimately equal the solubility because it would be equilibrium within here. Don't know how long it would have to take, but in the limit, if you're flowing very slowly, then that would be the case. If, in the converse, if you took this to 100 meters per day, then maybe this amount would be 10 instead of 1,000. And so the mechanisms by which you can imagine this occurring is because the rate limiting process is the limit at which you can diffuse this into the water, which then carries it downstream. And so you might not expect the solubility of this, sorry, the concentrations coming out of this tank to be equal to the solubility, but to be some fraction for this. So you might expect that. Okay, final, final uh, parting shot. So the other thing that we could do is that if you have a plume and you know what the shape of that plume is, you might want to be able to calculate how much mass that's present within these uh, plumes. And so these little ink spots are actually uh, little plan views of the shapes of plumes. Some are uh, long and elongate. I guess this would be the source region and this would be the downstream spreading out as it goes downstream. And some look like um, kidneys maybe. I'm not sure what these things look like. But if you knew, for instance, the area of this and its depth, in other words, its volume, one thing you could do is you could try and calculate the mass of components which are present within that. And it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. And so what we could do is we could calculate the mass that's present within the plume, but we know there are two parts. We could sample the stuff that's in the water, and it would have some concentration. If we think that sorption plays a role in this, then the concentration in water would also be at equilibrium with the concentration that's on the, the solid grains. And so if we look at the mass that's present, there's some amount that's present in the water and there's some that's present in the sorbent mass. We know that the amount within the water would be in the volume, so this is this Vt is what we've called V, through score, right? Just that's my standard, I guess I could do a through score here. So this is the total volume of the plume in meters cubed, including all the porous material that's inside it. So it's the plan area multiplied by the depth of the thickness of the aquifer, multiplied by the porosity. If it's saturated, this would be the volume of water. So this is the volume of water. I can draw it better than that. This here is the volume of water. And if you multiply the volume of water by the concentration, mass per unit volume, then this gives you the mass that's present in the water. So this is one component. But we know also there's a portion which is the sorbent mass. And so the, the, the mass, the concentration that's present of that solute that's present on the grains, multiplied by the density of the aquifer, 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter maybe, 
would give you the mass per unit volume that's present within the aquifer. And if you multiply by the volume of the aquifer again, you get the mass that's present absorbed on the grains. We know from what we talked about before, what KD was, was that if you take the concentration on the solid phase and the concentration in the water, that the relationship between those, I think, uh, no, I think, is equal to KD over 1, right? So in other words, C star, the concentration on the solid divided by the concentration in the liquid is just equal to this. That's all this says, right? For this linear isotherm. Then if we rearrange this uh, like this, then what we could do is we could substitute for this concentration on the solid and get it defined in terms of the concentration in the liquid part, which is all we typically have. And if we combine these two terms together, this is, uh, I guess the punchline is this. Don't care about the derivation, care about the punchline. Is that the mass that's present within these plumes, the mass of solute, is going to be given by the liquid concentration, the solute concentration in the liquid phase, the porosity, the total volume of the plume, area times depth, and the retardation factor, because this distribution coefficient comes into this. You can do this calculation to figure out what the equation is, but it's basically this. So it's actually very compact and very logical. And so the mass for a conserved solute would be equal to 1 times this value. And if it's a lot of it is sorbed onto the substrate, then the amount that's present is going to be proportionately much larger that's present in the system. And so I think it's always kind of a sobering observation to look at the magnitudes that come out that have caused these plumes, which have volumes of 6 billion liters. And the amount that's contributed to that in, is, that's in dissolved form or sorbed form in the aquifer is actually a very small amount, including, for instance, this amount here, uh, which is quarter, no, four, yeah, four tenths of a drum of TCE has resulted in a plume. I guess there's no length scales on here, but you can figure out what the volumes are based on this. And so very small amounts of these components can give you very large plumes because they're present at very low concentrations. I guess this, one's a natural consequence of the other. And so the bottom line is, I suppose, is that from what we've talked about previously between conservative and non-conservative transport. Uh, we realize this, this retardation factor is a key variable that defines how quickly a plume travels and therefore how quickly it arrives at some downstream location. But also because of these features with multiple solutes, we have to know, one, how to get the value of KD for when we're talking about non-brown um, greenfield sites non-brown field sites where we'd want to be able to estimate what this retardation factor would be. And we also want to know how this behavior occurs if we have multiple competing species. Um, if we know the, the role of sorption, then we can also calculate this final calculation we did was the, the mass in place. So I'll leave it at that right